So uh, first what I want to do, if, if you don't mind, it's a nice boots. It's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I like those. Um, uh, is uh, I want to ask you to introduce yourself in terms of your responsibilities at each of your uh, <laughs> companies. Um, this is a bit like having Coke and Pepsi uh, on the same <laughs> stage. Um, and I appreciate your willingness to have this conversation together. So first, John, what are your responsibilities at Visa? I'm the president of Visa, and I'm responsible for all our technology, our, um, our product initiatives, marketing, customer support, customer service, um, globally. A shooting match. Dan? I'm uh, the group president of Enterprise Growth. I'm responsible for all of our digital efforts as we move from physical to digital, all of our moves into emerging markets, and all of our alternate payments, anything really outside of charge and credit. So a lot of the new products that you've developed over the past few years, and particularly uh, some of the acquisitions that we'll get into uh, later. Yep. Now, both of your companies are, are major players in terms of payment online. It's a big part of, of, you know, uh, of your transactions. What part of it is it? How, how big has it gotten for you, you know, as a percentage, perhaps, if you have those figures available, uh, of, of the you know, transactions across your networks? has online become? Well, you want to go? <laughs> um, for, from Visa's perspective, about 16% of uh, our, our payment volume is, uh, is online. Wow, 16%. Out of 3.5 trillion. And only 5% of, of, of overall retail is online, which means that you have a much larger percentage on your network that's online than the average. Is that true for American Express as well? Yeah, last year we did 100 billion uh, online, going at about 20% plus. The first six months of this year we did about 60 billion, still growing at about 20% plus. So um, although uh, it's growing quite quickly, there's a tremendous amount of growth left. And as we think about it, we think that really the distinction between online and offline is blurring. So although people tend to think about e-commerce or online as commerce you do behind your desktop. Um, I think uh, in the future, certainly, because we're all carrying the internet with us, when we walk into a uh, retail store, we have the, exactly the same information overlay in front of us. So we're looking at that information overlay, and the only difference uh, in the future will be, can I grab that product right then and now and check out, or will I digitally download it uh, or have it shipped to me uh, the next day? So I think that distinction is going away, although the way people talk about it today, it's probably 8 to 10 percent of overall retail. Right. Okay. And I, I would agree with Dan in that there is this convergence of, of mobile and e-commerce and the social networks and, and the physical point of sale. Um, and, you know, over the coming years, that convergence is going to continue to happen. Now, I want to get into, uh, I guess you could call it brand. I think when people think about paying online, um, they might think PayPal. <coughs> um, they, might, they might now think Square um, or, or view Square as kind of a leader in payment online. Um, I don't know that they think American Express or Visa. Is that an, something you want to change or is that fine? We're, we're okay being the brand behind the brands that people think of when they think of payment. Well, f for Visa, 46% of, uh, of all transactions online are with the Visa product. Um, and you know, with that, you know, the consumer looks to the Visa brand in terms of its, its trust, its reliability. Um, and PayPal is uh, our second largest merchant. So um, a significant part of the payments that go through PayPal go through, um, go through a Visa product and are processed on our network. So, um, you know, so we... Uh, cooperate in, with PayPal uh, in that regard, but they're also, obviously, we compete with them in some other ways. But um, Visa has by far the largest share uh, of payments on the Internet. Dan, do you, do you see American Express as a primary online brand or as a partner online brand? Yeah. Well, I think... Um, we're reasonably well uh, positioned as we go into this sort of convergence of online and offline. 
I do believe what actually each of our brands stand for, but the American Ex Express brand stands for security. It stands for customer service. And it stands for integrity. And I do think as we move into this digital future where you're going to be storing your commerce identity uh, in the cloud, you're going to be electing to expose that and create uh, and enable forms of digital commerce, that uh, data privacy, uh, trust in the brand um, that's going to be protecting that, uh, the ability to call somebody when something goes wrong. Because we're not talking about your social identity, we're talking about your commerce identity. If you do a transaction and you don't see that transaction, you want to be able to call somebody. Um, and so I think those brand attributes are going to play quite strong uh, as we look to the future ahead. Uh, in addition, you know, last uh, uh, March, we rolled out our Serve platform. We put right. it under the Serve brand name um, as opposed to American Express. It's backed by American Express. Uh, but Serve is a digital payments and commerce uh, platform. And we've already, in the uh, uh, six or so months since we've launched it, signed up uh, some 14 partners uh, to it, done a number of acquisitions to bring on capability sets. And so. I think as we think about uh, where we are right now with the brand attributes, our platform, and, and some partnerships, early partnerships, uh, uh, hopefully uh, it'll put us in a position to be able to compete vigorously as we go forward. So just to make sure I, I understand, Serve will be and is really a direct competitor to, to PayPal. Yeah, so in many ways, just like uh, John mentioned, uh, we partner with PayPal, but uh, there are obviously uh, places where our ambitions uh, cross over. We believe very much uh, that the entire commerce life cycle is being redefined, that the digitization of information from discovery to payments uh, to, uh, uh, to receipts and money management, all of that uh, is being recreated. Um, and uh, we want to be a, a leading player in that. So in some places, we will uh, compete in other places, uh, we'll partner. It's still very early innings to define that exactly. Um, Serve as a payment processing platform will accept all forms of payment, not just American Express, which means that you will be a partner with your friend here, John, right? And so Visa will be We're not friends by... yet. We're just, uh, we just, we just I, my goal is to make you guys friends. Um, and I don't know if I'm going to succeed, but I'll try. In 20 um, minutes. Yeah. <laughs> in 20 right. minutes, right. 20 minutes or less. Um, but do you so, see, uh, serve as a, another gateway for, for Visa customers? So, so first of all, you know, we have announced that we are bringing into the market a digital uh, wallet. Um, uh, and it's going to be open. So it would take American Express, Visa cards, uh, MasterCard. It'll take um, proprietary private label cards. We believe that it should be open and that, um, and that that container should basically reflect what you have in your physical wallet. Um, Serve today will take payment from a Visa card to load a virtual prepaid card. And we haven't talked, but I'm sure you have plans to do more than just have it be a you know, a P2P payment vehicle. So I think, I, th I think Dan hit it correctly in that, you know, we're at a point where um, the landscape is changing um, rather dramatically and rather quickly. And there's no question that the technology exists um, to, um, to enable a lot, of, uh, a lot of innovation into the payment space. Um, but, you know, having said that, I think that the the issue around um, the permissions and the credentials of you as a consumer, where does that, where does, where does that reside? And then, and then how do you then manage that? So that not only for payments, but you know, whether or not you want to share that information, whether you want to opt in for uh, offers, do you want to get alerts on your transactions? You know, it's that you as the consumer are in control of that and that you, your permissions and your credentials um, are secure and safe. Um, and I think that um, as this unfolds over the course of the next several years, I think you're going to find that a lot of our strategies are very similar and it's really going to come down to who can execute um, and then what types of services uh, are you able to provide to the consumer uh, that would differentiate your offering from, from, from the other offerings. What do both of you worry about 
in terms of threats from the the valley or what the valley represents just you know entrepreneurial companies that have new solutions um, who may resist your desire to purchase them <laughs> or um, <laughs> or uh, very large established platform digital companies that uh, may look at your businesses and say, well, that looks like a pretty good business to get into. What, what, what keeps you up uh, at night about that kind of thing? Who, who are you worried about? So I think um, for any large company, um, when the future is changing as rapidly as things are in both the uh, payments industry as well as commerce uh, writ large, um, it is more difficult for a big company to, uh, to change. Um, your classic knee-jerk reaction is to try and do the things that you did in the past that got you to where you are and to do them more efficiently and better. Um, and that may be a reasonable strategy when things aren't moving as quickly, but it isn't a, a viable strategy when uh, the future is changing. And I, I liken it to uh, steering a ship by the wake of the boat uh, as opposed to looking ahead. So I do think that um, uh, from a, a big company perspective, we need to think about our models differently. We need to think very uh, clearly about how do we partner, how do we differentiate, who do we hire, um, what's the culture going to be like. But I do think in general, although there are threats obviously that come in, the opportunities may be even greater for us. Uh, it enables us at American Express to um, target new segments of the market that we were never able to address before. Before, we were primarily mass affluent, primarily a U.S. So when you say company. mass affluent, in other words, you're, you created products for as many people who had a lot of money as possible. Yeah, that would be mass <laughs> affluent, yeah. Um, and, you know, there's a reasonable amount of that, but there is a, a large uh, amount of consumers in the U.S. that are either millennials that don't want credit or have thin credit files, there are people who are underbanked or unbanked. Uh, and when you go into digital payments, you can address those because you can fund your digital platform from any source, really. You can fund it from a debit card. You can fund it from a checking account. You could fund it from cash. Frankly, you could fund it through virtual currency and do conversions around it. So you can address new market segments. And then there are other parts of the world, very vibrant, growing economies that are predominantly cash-based. You look at India today, India, maybe 2 to 3% uh, of the entire payments industry is done by charge or, uh, or credit. Um, and those markets aren't going to go the same way the U.S. did from cash to checks to plastic to digital payments. They will leapfrog from uh, cash to digital payments. And so it's a... Uh, uh, opportunity for us to penetrate markets that we weren't able to penetrate with our traditional products before. And as we look at digital commerce, I do think that digital commerce will make marketing much more efficient. And if we can play a role in helping that to happen, uh, then there are new revenue streams available as well. So there are threats, but there are a lot of opportunities as well. One of the ways both of your companies has addressed the speed of the uh, market is by either making investments and or by acquiring companies. Can you give us, uh, John and Dan, two or three of those that you've done recently that, 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 and kind of give us the background as to why you did them? Uh, well, we, we acquired CyberSource uh, just over a year ago. Uh, CyberSource is a um, e-commerce gateway uh, provider. Um, and also, um, they provide risk uh, management services for uh, e-commerce merchants. About 25% of all e-commerce um, flows through CyberSource. So um, they have today about 400,000 merchants uh, through their Authorize.net uh, platform. Uh, and we purchased Authorize.net or uh, CyberSource for a number of reasons. One. Um, we felt we needed to uh, be able to have that direct interaction uh, with with the merchant uh, to be able to um, to take products to to market directly uh, with them. Um, we felt that we could, using the information we had with respect to uh, our fraud capabilities and CyberSource's fraud capabilities, we could significantly uh, increase um, the ability to de to detect fraud and, and in fact. Um, that has turned out to be the case. 
Um, and uh, with Authorize.net came a uh, development center. So uh, we've expanded on that development developer capability in terms of being able to expose various APIs uh, to the developer community. So today you can do um, our APIs for P2P payment. Um, we're going to continue to expand that. So we're going to open up the VisaNet network uh, to developers. Uh, we uh, purchased PlaySpan, um, which is um, a payments uh, platform within the virtual goods uh, mm -hmm. space. Uh, we did that one to have, um, to have a presence in that marketplace, as well as to use um, you know, their payment capability, that one-click uh, capability that's embedded um, in the gaming industry to be able to take that um, and move that into the e-commerce world. So uh -huh. that will be the foundation for, it is the foundation for, um, for our digital wallet. And then uh, just touching on um, what Dan talked about, um, we just uh, closed on our transaction for a company called Fundamo. Uh, Sorry, the name again? Fundamo, it's a South African company. Um, and they have um, a payments platform, a digital payments platform. Um, that has uh, 55 installations and primarily working with uh, mobile network operators in, in developing and emerging countries. Um, and they're primarily, they're, they're closed loop today so that you can, within, um, within a, a mobile network operator's um, network, you can make uh, P2P transfers um, and you can do some bill payments. So we're going to um, we're going to overlay that with uh, VisaNet and open all of those uh, networks up um, so that uh, you can pay cross network um, and you can then move into doing e-commerce transactions um, with this Visa overlay. So those are some examples of 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 companies we bought and we we, we bought them one you know and, and it is and again uh, something that Dan touched on, which is. You know, for large established companies, changing the way you do business um, is 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 difficult sometimes. And you know, up until um, probably very recently, um, Visa developed all their own applications and their own products and services. So our buying cyber source, PlaySpan, Fundamo, and integrating them into uh, our e-commerce and mobile strategies is a, a significant departure. It's a new set of muscles. It's a whole new set of muscles, yeah. and, and quite frankly, you know, the cultural change within the company is, is one, of, um, one of the challenges we have because okay. the whole way they take mar uh, product to market is much, differently, much different than how we can take a product for VisaNet because within VisaNet itself, you have thousands of people that connect to that network, so you've got to give them you know, significant lead time in terms of changes you're going to be making to VisaNet so that they can, uh, they can right. incorporate those changes. Whereas with what we're doing with CyberSource or Fundamo or PlaySpan, we're introducing new code you know, once or twice a week. Right. They are on the periphery of, periphery of our network. So it's a different, um, if it's a different business and uh, a different culture and a different set of, of, of processes yeah. that we've had to adopt. You see the same thing with the moves that American Express has made. You've done a lot of interesting sort of partnership deals as well with, with companies in this space. Yeah. So we look at uh, three different things. We look at uh, what technology can we uh, uh, tuck in to the uh, platform. So we are constantly evaluating kind of the newest stuff coming out and where might an acquisition of that help to accelerate our platform efforts going forward. Um, and that could be either in just talent, quite frankly, or it could be in a capability set. Uh, we're looking for either partnerships. Uh, it could be a JV. It could be an acquisition. It could just be an investment uh, in distribution partners to get us into uh, either new uh, parts of the world or um, new segments uh, of the market. And finally, uh, we are also uh, opening up the entire serve platform uh, this quarter. We'll start our pilots. Uh, on that uh, through API sets uh, to the development community. I think uh, you, know, you can have a great platform, um, but you need to put scale uh, on right. that platform. And um, uh, we believe that the expertise that comes with payments, you know, I've only been with American Express a year uh, right. now. So I come from wireless industry, I come from uh, technology industry before that. And um, um, 
I thought coming in that all the regulation and all of the uh, uh, compliance from anti-money laundering to FinCEN to know your customer, uh, I just thought that was just going to slow everything down. What I kind of realize right now is it's a huge competitive advantage because it is so difficult to actually do that. I was looking at a startup the other day uh, that I was thinking of bringing on. They had had some initial success. And what I realized when we were doing due diligence is their initial success was they were basically not following Know Your Customer and other types of, of, uh, of they, regulation. They were basically breaking the law. They're basically <laughs> you know, flying under the sort radar. Sort of like Michael screen. Dell with the F. <laughs> yes. yeah. And uh, you know you really can't fly under the radar screen once you get to uh, to right. scale of some sort. So uh, that kind of fraud management, all that unsexy type of stuff, is actually incredibly important uh, uh, and difficult to replicate. I have a question for uh, for you both on the sort of the theme of the conference. And if any of you have questions, please come up to the mics now as we're getting low on time. Um, and that has to do with data. Um, you both have a bit of a different approach to data. American Express has what you call the closed loop uh, relationship between the consumer, the merchant, and American Express. You have partners with commercial, with merchant banks, um, and you are the network upon which they transact. But regardless of how you, you know, closed loop or your, or your open network, you both have a ton of data, uh, extraordinary amount of data about how people why people, where people, how much people are spending. Um, that is a massive asset for you, but it's also highly regulated. How, how do you look at that in, in the world we're in now uh, as either leverage or, or an asset you need to protect or extend? So I think that data is really the holy grail of digital commerce going forward. Uh, we believe in it very strongly. I think when we talk about digital commerce, we're talking about when you go online and you click on something to either get a deal, a discount, it's an advertisement, you, that's basically 70% of that today results in an offline transaction and you can't follow that all the way through. And so the ability to um, take that data, to be able to click on something, drag it into a master account or a digital platform, follow that all the way to the transaction and the data that comes from that transaction and be able to feed back to a retailer or a marketer, the entire closed loop of that marketing return on investment um, in ways that are much more targeted, much more micro-segmented than ever before. I think you know, we're gonna look back five years from now and see this barrage of offers and everything we got for you know, spa service and hair removal and whatever as, you know, as uh, <laughs> just really not anywhere near to the place where we're going to be micro-segmented. Kind of what offer do you want to give today to John? What offer today do you want to give to Dan? Based on our ability to use these digital platforms and transmit data and information back and forth. That data and information has to be kind of opt-in. It has to be held private. It's, there are a lot of security measures around it. But I can't stress how important that data is to facilitating this flow of digital commerce uh, and payments going forward. And, and we think of it as, uh, as probably the biggest asset uh, that we have. So I, I would just echo what Dan said. Um, you know, both of us are in a position to where we can, you know, we are, we are, we can see where, tran where the transactions take place both online and offline. Um, and our ability to take that information and to, um, work with merchants and to work with offers with a, with the customer opting in for that service, um, we think it can be, um, we think it's a significant um, advantage uh, for us. Um, I mean, in terms of data, um, you know, we have two billion cardholders, um, 30 million merchants around the world. So we have a significant lead in terms of understanding what those consumers are doing. Um, and we've used data for a long, for a long time. Uh, we've used data to help us find the fraudulent transactions. We've used data to help, um, to help merchants and financial institutions to take that information and to enhance their own fraud um, capabilities. And we've used anonymous data to help merchants uh, decide where they should put a store because we've got it down to zip code. 
So you can tell you know, within a zip code what kinds of transaction trends are, and are taking place. So we've used data so far uh, t um, uh, to create value. And, and I think that as we move forward over these next um, several years, the ability to uh, have the consumer opt in for, um, for the use of that data so that they can, um, they can get meaningful value delivered to them, um, we think is, uh, is going to be a real differentiator. So I think we're very much in alignment. I want to ask one last quick question before we get to these two, and that's going to have to be it because I know we're, we're short on time. But I wouldn't feel, you know, given the events of the last few weeks, I, I feel like I need to ask you, there's been a roiling sort of, you know, uh, upswell uh, in, in the, not just the United States, now across the world, um, that sort of began, uh, God knows where you could put the exact beginning, but began with, with the, the crisis of 2008, 2009, and seems to be rolling through the economy. There were some rules that were passed that, dramatically changed your business in terms of financial reform, including Durbin, which changed the, actually regulated the amount of uh, margin you were allowed to charge on your networks. Um, what do you make of all of this as leaders of these very large financial institutions um, who, uh, you know, there is, there is now a sort of Twitter and Facebook driven storm uh, that's happening in the real world. When you see those news reports and you perhaps see them outside your offices, what, 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 what is your response to that? Well, you know, I think that um, there is a concern in terms of what's, what's transpired around the world economically. Um, and whether it's, you know, whether it's the, the debt crisis in, in Greece or it was the mortgage crisis in, uh, in, in the U.S., um, there, is, there is significant... Um, certainly significant pent up anger about how did we end up in, in, in this situation. And, and the, the Financial Reform Act that was passed by uh, the Congress uh, was um, supposed to address some of those, um, some of those, some of the concerns that led to, um, led to that collapse. Um, Is there your sense that perhaps that didn't happen? Well, I, it, it, I don't think it's necessarily happened, but what also is taking place is no jobs are being created. And so it's, it's not only the financial, it's not only the financial system uh, that people um, are concerned about. The fact of the matter is that, that jobs aren't being created either. There's no growth really that's taking place. And so there's a lot of concern about that. Um, with respect to, um, to Durban, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not, it's not, you, one can't assume or even think that um, the financial crisis that the, fi that the U.S. faced or the debt crisis in, in, um, in Greece was caused because, of, um, because of, of debit interchange in the United States. So um, that, was, um, that, was, that was put in the Durban, um, the Durban Amendment into the Financial Reform Act. Um, and there were going to be um, there were going to be unintended consequences that came from that. Um, there was an effort to delay that uh, so that they, there could be a study done um, on those consequences. Um, the Senate chose not to do that, um, and so what you're seeing today, um, in terms of some of the fees that the banks are charging, um, you know, that's the bank's business, and and. Um, and they're reacting to uh, the change in, in, in the regulatory environment. Um, but it, what it also has done is, um, you know, in terms of payments, it's capped uh, debit interchange at 24 cents. Um, so um, it's not only going to affect our business, I think it's going to affect a lot of people's business because, um, you know, moving to the physical point of sale, um, you know, what problem are you going to then solve in terms of, tapping with a phone or with a card or swiping with, with, with your plastic card. Um, if that's now capped at 24 cents and you get all of the, you, the liability, um, the consumer doesn't have a liability, uh, you get the chargeback rights, et cetera, what is really going to move to an alternative form of payment because the economics have changed rather significantly because of the Durban Amendment? Dan, if you could wave a wand and change things in Washington, what would you do? <laughs> you mean writ larger uh, payments industry? I mean, uh, 
There's so much I would change in Washington. Um, but uh, Just one thing, because we have people waiting to ask questions, yeah. and I know we're out of time. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, actually, uh, you can't really do it in one uh, comment, Washington, D.C. Um, <laughs> uh, look, uh, the truth of the matter is, um, from a regulatory perspective, when people are on the side of consumers and doing the right thing, that's the right place to be. Uh, and the reason... You know, I spent 10 years in startups. The reason I came here to Amex is I do believe with this digital revolution, we can finally start to create value propositions for segments of the market that don't have a voice traditionally, right? That are underbanked or unbanked. They get hit with fee after fee after fee. And if we can change the value proposition, um, and I think there's a big opportunity to change the value proposition to create different types of uh, financial products that help with inclusion, and frankly, I think um, that's where I'm excited about uh, leveraging off of that. Quick questions, because we're over time and I'm getting flashed at here by my <laughs> confidence monitor. Uh, hi, I'm Dean Putney. I'm the software developer at Boing Boing. I actually want to pose sort of a very broad question, uh, in particular with digital goods and uh, services becoming more prevalent, and as well as uh, money going digital, as you've been discussing. And uh, also considering the, the disparity of wealth in the world as it is now, do you see the concept of money becoming, the, the general concept of money becoming more or less important or changing in, uh, in particular in a, in a time span even beyond all our own lives? Yeah. I personally think the concept of money um, is going to change for us. I think there's going to be... Uh, um, you'll think about money in different ways. You'll think about just how do I purchase something? Can I purchase it with virtual currencies and conversions I have, with loyalty that I've earned, uh, sometimes with cash? Will I pay now, later? Will it be dynamic? So, uh, so much of what we think about right now of, of money is just a hard good or a check. I, I think that fundamentally changes as we go forward and think of it as just kind of a piece of information that we're going to be exchanging uh, for something else, uh, a good that we're, uh, or a piece of information that we're um, looking to, uh, uh, to gain ownership over or share at some point. So I do think that fundamental concept is going to change. Money has not changed very much. I mean, for, for us in the, on this stage, you know, in financial services, somebody told me before I came uh, to American Express that uh, we move in 700-year increments, you know. So um, <laughs> cash took forever, and are then, those, you know, check was around. So are those dog years? I think uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> that might even be longer. So I do think we are in for uh, a lot of change going forward. Not, it's not going to happen next year or the year after, but this is when ecosystems are being formed right now, and I do think, uh, think things will change significantly three to five to seven years from now. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really an exchange of value, and that that value can be represented by much more than just hard currency. And yeah. so, the ability to be able to um, have that that uh, that exchange of value is really what I think the space is really going to bring to all to, to to commerce. Thank you. Hopefully, it'll be a quick question because I'm. Really, really out of time. It'll be fast. Uh, Neff Hudson from USAA. Uh, John Donahoe from uh, eBay uh, hinted very strongly yesterday that PayPal is exploring direct uh, payment methods with major retailers. And the major retailers have had no secret of the fact that they're not real happy with the interchange fee structure around credit card as well. Now that debits are sort of in the rear view. How disruptive do you think that would be to actually do some direct payment methods with, between PayPal and the major retailers? And how do you go about uh, rebuilding some of the re merchant relationships that are obviously a bit damaged right now? Well, I think um, you know one you know one of the areas that we are focusing on is the relationship with with the merchants and the retailers. Um, so, um, as we look for how we can use data, um, you know we are um, looking at how we can provide value through that data to retailers. So whether that's to um, help them, um, and we're, we're we've been able to demonstrate this with our uh, purchase of CyberSource how we can help them in terms of the management of fraud. Um, we are uh, entering into um, marketing agreements with retailers uh, to be able to um, uh, use offers from those retailers, um, pair that up with some of our consumers who have opted in or their own consumer base uh, to be able to, to deliver offers to them 
uh, through mobile devices um, and through um, their, their, their desktops. So we're looking for ways in which we can create value and, um, and move away from just a discussion in terms of the cost of doing business. Um, with respect to um, you know, PayPal moving to the physical point of sale, um, you know, I think that one of the, um, you know, certainly one of the advantages that Visa has and American Express has, we're already there. And as I said earlier, there are 30 million merchants where uh, they accept uh, Visa today. And so what problem are we trying to solve? Um, you know, today, you, you know, it's very easy. You walk in, you've got the security, the reliability, uh, and the availability of the network. It works, it works at scale. Um, you know, we have the capability to process 20,000 transactions a second. Um, I think PayPal today processes 150 transactions a second. Um, so that scale, which is uh, what Dan talked about, um, is, um, is a, significant, um, a significant attribute that delivers value to, to the merchant community. Um, I also think that um, with respect to um, you know, the, the trust uh, that, that people have in the Visa brand, the consumer has in the Visa brand, um, and the liability that, that they don't have, the consumer. Um, you know, we think that those, um, you know, those attributes from a consumer perspective are going to be, um, are going to, going to allow us to continue to be very successful at the point of sale. Dan, last word. Yeah, so very quickly, uh, we've tried to uh, create value between the consumer and the merchant. That's kind of the ethos of the company. But I do think as we move into this age of digital commerce, that value is going to expand dramatically. If you look at offline retailers compared to online retailers, uh, you look at market caps and what's happened over the last five years, the offline retailer is having a very difficult time uh, competing because of this convergence of online and offline. But I believe that digital commerce can actually change that balance uh, that's going on right now, that the offline retailer instead of spending $300 billion a year, whatever they spend right now on marketing and couponing and advertising that's tremendously inefficient, can actually be much more targeted, can go after that consumer, can create the value to compete against online players. And uh, I think platforms uh, like the one that we're creating can help to enable that. So I think the conversations are gonna become much more rich, much more uh, valuable, and. Uh, and are going to start to talk about how do you drive incremental sales, how do you cut marketing costs, as opposed to just about interchange uh, itself. Well, thank you. Thank you for your question, and join me in thanking both Dan and John. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. That was wonderful.